Hi, everyone. This is Brooke Rollins, president and CEO of the America First Policy Institute. Uh, one of the great blessings of, frankly, my life has been being a part of this incredible organization uh, after leaving the last White House with President Trump. And one of the best parts about that is getting to work with the most talented, extraordinary patriots uh, in our country today, and I would argue perhaps um, in our country's history. One of those is with me today, uh, the incredible Congressman Lee Zeldin, who has been alongside us on this journey for the last about year and a half, uh, really helping lead with the amazing Ashley Hayek, our 501c4 America First Works, our pathway initiative to victory uh, this fall and to governing, uh, hopefully beyond that. But as we like to joke at America First Policy Institute, uh, once you prove how good you are, you get more and more jobs. And so Lee was so gracious uh, as we were thinking through the most important, uh, the most challenging policy challenges to our country today. And uh, one of those at the very top of the list is certainly China. So uh, Congressman Zeldin, what a joy to have you as part of the team. What an incredible honor to have you agree to lead our China policy initiative, uh, initiative that we launched almost at the beginning of AFPI, realizing that many of the lessons learned in the last White House um, and, and really some of the great decisions and leadership by President Trump uh, included his leadership and his approach to China, which many would argue was was different uh, than previous, especially Republican, well, and Democrat predecessors. So, A, I welcome you to the team again. Uh, very excited to have you on the policy side of the House. Uh, and B, just a thank you for your incredible leadership and and patriotism and devotion to uh, to saving this country. So, welcome. Thank you, Brooke. And I've had an opportunity to come across a lot of organizations since I first got to Congress in January of 2015, uh, organizations that are on the right, the center, the left, uh, some that I was able to work more closely with than others. And I have never come across an organization uh, like AFPI. Uh, the culture, the, the, the moral compass, the intellectual capability, uh, AFPI has been proudly at the tip of the spear on so many important efforts here over the course of the last few years. Uh, so grateful that coming out of the White House that you and a couple of other key people were willing to take this on to lead this effort and you've really turned it into something special. So uh, truly an honor to be part of a America First Policy Institute and America First Works. And uh, Brooke, thank you so much for your leadership. Oh, well, I, Lee, thank you for that. And, and that means so much. I often say, and I know you appreciate this, that uh, the only thing that I am really good at, and I think you're obviously good at a lot of things, but the only thing I'm really good at is uh, finding amazing people and uh, giving them the opportunity and the platform perhaps to go change the world. So having you at the very top of that list uh, continues to be just wonderful. So thank you. Um, you, obviously most people know your background. You were in Congress for eight years. Uh, interestingly, for a little while, the only Jewish Republican in Congress, um, which I know today we're talking about the China Policy Initiative, but on the world scale and certainly uh, we just passed the one year mark of uh, what happened uh, in Israel, you've got certainly a, a really interesting and incredible perspective and leadership on that. You were on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, you served in the House Financial Services Committee. You were co-chair of the House Republican Israel Caucus. Of course, your beloved New York. Uh, everyone knows the incredible story uh, of you running for governor in a state that no one really uh, gave you much of a chance. And with 22% registered Republicans in very blue New York, uh, you blew every expectation. And now that I know you so well, I consider you one of my dearest friends uh, and, and confidants, but now that I know you so well, I'm not surprised, but I didn't know you well when you were making that run. And when those numbers were coming back in and as we were getting closer to that election just a few years ago, uh, you only lost that race by a couple of points in deep blue New York. So uh, before we dive into China, just tell us a little bit about that experience, too, and, and how it colors everything you do today. I found that there are a whole lot of Democratic voters who are waiting for conservatives to show up. They actually connect quite strongly with yeah. the America First 
message when we're talking about ways in which we can make the economy stronger, our border more secure, to make our streets safer, uh, to protect parental rights, uh, promote school choice, improve the quality of education or schools, to lift people out of poverty and to give opportunities to families that have been struggling for a long time. They, they've been waiting for a while for conservatives to show up. I think one of the worst assumptions that conservatives have made for a long time is assuming that these longtime Democratic voters would just come around on their own. They are ready wow. for us, but you have to show up. And uh, I, I found during my race for governor in 2022 in New York, as I was traveling around the state, especially inside of these deep blue uh, areas of New York City, uh, I could be inside of Manhattan, Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, uh, and these groups were, were ready. The Asian American community, especially the Dominican community. Uh, we did very well with the Hispanic vote. Uh, we did very well with the Orthodox Jewish vote in Brooklyn and places like Borough Park and Williamsburg and Crown Heights, where I, I expect President Trump to do well November 5th. Uh, and it, it wasn't about showing up and pandering. Uh, you know, you and I have, have spoken about this in the past. It's about showing up and substantively uh, connecting with these people on issues that transcend blind partisan loyalty. So for uh, people around the country who are trying to learn anything from the 2022 gubernatorial race in New York, uh, I, I would say that that would be lesson number one. Uh, I would say it's important to understand that you have to campaign as a team, top down, bottom up on a ticket, uh, that you really need to ensure that voters know not just what you're against, but especially what you're for. And I think it's uh, important for another reason to get into the city that the uh, media is based inside of these cities and in the suburbs, they get their news out of the city and the media isn't going to spend their time bouncing all over the suburbs. Uh, you have to connect with stories that are very close to home from there for where they live and where they work as reporters, as journalists, and kind of make it easy and cover a topic that they can't not cover. Uh, so that when people are waking up in the morning or going to sleep at night and getting caught up on the news because they're otherwise very busy with other priorities in life, they're seeing you there at that crime scene talking about the contrast between democratic policies and conservative policies to make streets safer, to have prosecutors who prosecute, to pass laws that prioritize law-abiding citizens and to protect our men and women in blue. And because of that, in the suburbs, because they might not live in a city, they might not even work in the city, but they're getting their news from there and they care about these issues. All of a sudden, people are talking about crime and the economy and education and more because that's what's coming out of that media market. So a lot of lessons to be learned, not just the importance of showing up. Um, and, I, and I think that it's a lesson that's gonna apply really all across the country going into the future. Uh, 2022 should have been a national red wave, and it wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's important for us to understand why to make sure the history doesn't repeat itself. Well, I think that's really well said. And and kind of pivoting now to policy, uh, which is really, I think, your message that when we lead with policy and we leave no stone unturned and we leave no community unvisited or un, uh, you know, no door unknocked, if you will, that those are our people. And one of the most incredible um, clarifying moments for me, and of course I was in the last White House, but in building the America First Policy Institute, it was really important to me to understand where the country was. So we took that America First agenda, uh, which would have been the second term agenda, which um, we had built out in the last year of the last White House. And then we took it to the people and we poll tested it and value lettered it and focus grouped it. And at the end of the day, almost every single America First issue, 80 to 85 percent of Americans agree with. So when you lift off the Republican versus Democrat or the conservative versus liberal, you know, all the monikers, you, you sort of peel away the, the tribes, if you will, and you just talk to everyday Americans. Do you want a border that is secure? Do you want an education system where the parents get to choose the best education for their children? Do you want a healthcare system where the patients and the doctors are in charge uh, versus the government or health insurance company? So when we would took that message to the people as we were building AFPI at the beginning and understanding where the country was, 
uh, I thought that was incredibly reassuring and, and really the, the heart of the America First Policy Institute is the policy. And as I mentioned at the top um, when we were doing the introductions, there's no question that uh, where America is in the world today versus where we were four years ago is vastly different. I think there's no question, um, no matter which political party you come from, that the uh, threat of China and um, and where China is in, in the world today is a serious cause of concern. And the idea that AFPI, through our China Policy Initiative, uh, would be tackling many of those, if not most of those issues, uh, is really what we're excited to have your leadership and the incredible China team at AFPI, I know, is, is so excited as well. So let me just dive in. Given um, We'll start with fentanyl. And given China's role in that global crisis, again, talking about multiple issues here that China is involved in, um, where do you see America and our hopefully new government that will be taking over early next year, where do you see us in terms of um, working to ensure that that dangerous supply, that deadly supply that's happened over the last four years and beyond uh, is diminished and, and hopefully completely cut off? Now, Brooke, um, I think it's great that you're starting with fentanyl. It's one of these examples of how foreign policy conflicts abroad, issues that we face mm -hmm. that might be thousands of miles away from home, couldn't possibly hit any closer to home. And there are too many Americans who have lost their loved ones, young sons and daughters. Uh, it, having to yeah. bury someone in your family unexpectedly because of a fentanyl overdose, it leads to, leads to communities and states looking for leadership out of Washington because they know that the illicit fentanyl trafficking is coming from places like China. And all of a sudden you have yeah. Americans who have only been concerned about their family and their community thinking about foreign policy, maybe for the first time uh, because of this loss, which is happening too often. China subsidizes companies to manufacture and export fentanyl that makes its way into the United States and is killing Americans. Uh, the, there is a select committee on China in the House uh, that the China Policy Initiative at AFPI has been working closely with, where there has been now receipts of China subsidizing these uh, manufacturers, these companies, and the United States has the ability to sanction these entities abroad. Uh, we can't turn a blind eye to this. We certainly need to, to, to be talking more about it. And maybe one of the biggest threats that the United States faces as it relates to China and the CCP is how there are still so many Americans who don't even yet understand the threat that China plays. They think, uh, you know, the, uh, the Cold War is over. Uh, there's no more conflict with the Soviet Union. It's been decades. You know, so we're moving on to a new reality where uh, we don't face a threat like that. Uh, and the, the fentanyl crisis is one of so many as it relates to China, where Americans are talking about foreign policy, even though they haven't in the past. I, I would encourage the United States government uh, to uh, read more of uh, what the House co Select Committee that came out of uh, the House Republican conference has put out over the course of the last year and a half and take action. If we know these companies exist, uh, it's time for us to ramp up the pressure beyond educating and advocating. Uh, we can actually use the levers of power to crack down on these entities abroad. I, I love that thought, Lee. And I think, you know, starting with fentanyl and then we'll move into some of the other uh, key questions with China. But when you think about the single mom from Detroit, right? And that's kind of how I often will think about public policy. Uh, I know a lot of us in this world um, are constantly uh, analyzing through all the big policy challenges. But if you think about that single mom in Detroit, right? She have a chance at the American dream. More importantly to her, do her kids have a chance at the American dream? They're getting the education. Do they have the health care? Does she have the good job that she needs to support that family? And I would suggest as a mom of four, you're a dad of two, the, your two girls have just gone off to college, that there isn't a person in this country who hasn't been touched by fentanyl overdose and what's happened and continues to get worse. So I think that 
um, there's a huge avenue there for, for real change and real work. But talking about posing a threat uh, on multiple levels, there's no doubt. And with your background, um, I know you're a proud member of our uh, United States military. You're still serving in the reserves and having served in Congress and been on the, the Foreign Affairs Committee. There's no question that from a military perspective, uh, the threat that China poses as well. So just your thoughts on that and, and what we need to be doing and thinking about as we move toward addressing that threat. This is a national security issue as well. You, you're talking about fentanyl and the good work of AFPI as it relates to border security and, and the yeah. way that uh, things come into our country across a border, through a port of entry. We often talk about people that come across, but also the things that come across. Uh, fentanyl is one of those examples. And as you think more about national security, there's a lot of pride that Americans have in our military. Uh, we have the greatest military in the history of the world. I believe that mm -hmm. strongly as a, a member of the military. I believe that our military should be America's greatest defenders. Uh, some who get uh, access to power at the highest levels of our government want to turn our military into some woke social experiment. We have the strongest Navy in the world. And uh, we also need to understand that China has the biggest Navy in the world. And when you look at China, one of the unique characteristics about a conflict in and challenges in the Pacific, as it might contrast to some of what we might be reading about when Russia goes into Ukraine or Hamas or Hezbollah going to Israel, is that a lot of that conflict in Asia is, is at sea. And when America's military, the strongest Navy in the world, is spread out with obligations and commitments all across the globe, China is able to take the biggest Navy in the world and deploy it more concentrated strategically in that area uh, closer to home for it. They also have a shipbuilding capacity that is well north of 200 to 1 when compared to the United States, which is crazy to think about. Uh, so I, I think that for Americans to understand uh, military-related conflict with China, which obviously we would love to avoid at all costs, we need to understand that uh, the traditional land, sea, air conflict that America has been engaged in, especially over the course of the last couple decades post 9-11, is very different uh, than what you might see right now in a reality around China today, which is very much uh, a conflict that is at sea. Uh, but I, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out uh, that China has a very aggressive Belt and Road strategy. Uh, they, they are certainly trying to flex into many other continents around the planet. And they're trying to establish strongholds uh, in places that are a lot closer to home for us here uh, in North America. Uh, so while we should be looking at that naval component uh, in around China, uh, we also need to understand that China's long-term plan here, they've strategically been making some very bold, aggressive moves uh, into the Western hem Hemisphere and closer to the United States. Uh, the, and, and as it relates to technology, as it relates to cyber warfare, uh, what is above us in satellites, uh, what is on the ground with regards to communications where uh, we, you know, Americans could travel to certain countries and they might not even realize that China has access to the calls they make, the emails they send, the texts they send on their phone while traveling abroad. So my last point I would say is that for any Americans who happen to be traveling abroad to protect your privacy, uh, to protect your personal information, uh, understand that China has uh, discovered some very aggressive ways to access our information, being able to tap right into our phone, which, by the way, even if you don't travel abroad, uh, there are some ways with some, um, some of what people have downloaded to their phone where, that, where China is able to get access to personal data right on our personal devices. Right. Well, and it's seemingly just threat after threat after threat. You talk about 200 to 1 shipbuilding capacity. I mean, that's that's hard to even process, right? I mean, how how have they been able to move so far ahead of us on that? 
that kind of capability. And, and it just goes to how extremely important an America first approach uh, to our military and to protecting our country really is. And, and speaking of, you know, another big one is our intellectual property. Uh, and I don't know how much you actually personally have, have delved into that, but that's another huge issue that we're having to deal with with China as well. That's right. We have a number of uh, higher education institutions that receive right. a lot of foreign funding. And they uh, engage in these research projects that uh, are funded in ways from the Department of Defense, from the Intel community. They do these joint projects uh, where foreigners end up getting involved in these research uh, efforts that are key to America's national security. And I think that uh, it, it ends up allowing China and the CCP to have access to uh, information at a very early stage. Oftentimes when we talk about patent and IP infringement, uh, it is companies that are much further along in a, in a process. They might have already received a patent. They might have already trademarked something and they're far along. And, and that's a real, and it's a real issue. And it's been, out, it's been going on for a long time. And if President Trump is back in office in, in 2025, maybe he can pick up right where he left off on uh, when he was trying to tackle this head on uh, in the U.S.-China uh, diplomatic uh, efforts and economic pressure and, and other instruments of national power that are used non-military to, to, to try to deal with it. Uh, but something that needs a whole lot more scrutiny fast is the amount of higher ed dollars that are coming in from, from abroad uh, and also these research projects that you, the U.S. taxpayer is paying for and at a very early stage, China's getting access. Well, and, and to your point, you think about um, China's influence on major U.S. industries, uh, we talk about big tech, but also Hollywood, um, education to your point. Uh, it just sort of seems like it's everywhere. We have had at AFPI the last few years been focusing on ag lands, that the, the purchase of, you know, agriculture lands all over this country, some of them near our military bases. Uh, these are really significant, very, very, very important policy issues that, you know, maybe Lee kind of taking us out from the policy discussion, just your thoughts on that and, and what the last administration has done or has not done. And really what a future administration should do to tackle all of these issues. Oh, I'm so, so happy that you're bringing up the U.S. agriculture component of it. And as you talk about supply chain resiliency, uh, yeah. you can even expand the scope into essential medicines to be able to have the materials uh, stockpiled, if not the final product, so that we're not relying on China uh, if we have that next uh, scare, that next emergency or that next foreign conflict, uh, we might find ourselves on the opposite side of China. We can't be relying in, uh, on China in that moment, and we have to think ahead of it. So there has been now well over 300,000 acres acquired of U.S. agriculture uh, that in U.S. farmland that, that China and the CCP have now gained access to through ownership. The last administration, when, when President Trump was in office in 2018, uh, he signed a new law and, and it was obviously so needed. And thank God uh, he, he got this through and passed so that when China is acquiring U.S. farmland that is near critical infrastructure, near airports, near military installations, uh, that there is a heightened review of this. Uh, because if it is done for strategic purposes and, and the CCP uh, are now able to gain access this close to critical infrastructure, uh, that needs to be stopped. Well, uh, China has now gone even further over the course of the last few years. Uh, it is a number that, that is up over 80% uh, over the course of the prior three years. Uh, this number is kept track of at the USDA website. Uh, where they keep tabs on the amount of uh, China-owned farmland here in the United States. It's been skyrocketing during the Biden-Harris administration. Uh, I think it's important to expand upon that law that President Trump uh, signed in 2018 
uh, as we see uh, that influence of CCP expanding uh, beyond just what's near military uh, installations, they're going much further. Uh, so I, I think it's a, a great point for you to t for for you to be touching on, and I would say that this is even more than a federal issue. That there are state and local governments that are growing increasingly concerned about CCP trying to gain influence to government, to ownership of real estate, and they want to know their options. So at the China Policy Initiative, uh, there has been an, a very active effort uh, to educate and to develop these partnerships uh, with state and local governments and to give them ideas, one of which uh, includes looking at the Foreign Agent Registration Act, which is a federal law that requires registration. But as uh, we're seeing at the state and local level, uh, people getting involved in trying to influence members of the government, uh, while it might not be triggering a, f a federal registration for some reason, maybe state houses need to look at passing a state version of the Foreign Agent Registration Act uh, to trigger that uh, at a more local level, even if it's not being triggered under the federal law. So that's something that the China Policy Initiative has been leading on. It's an example of one of many ways that state and local governments can do more. I think I love that point. And um, obviously, you know, I'm from Texas, worked in state policy forever. You were working to be the governor of a state. I mean, the founders envisioned the states as the guardians at the gate. And while, you know, in state policy, I'm not sure before the last few years, a state legislator in Texas or New York thought that they may need to lean into the, the China problem. But I think that we're now seeing a recalibration of the issue. So it isn't just a federal issue. It is a state and local issue as well. And I think that the China Policy Initiative led by you and uh, the incredible team at AFPI will continue to take a, a pretty big role in that. Um, and I'm, I'm proud of that. So as we conclude, Lee, let me ask you um, one final question, and that is regarding President Trump. Um, I know as a longtime lifelong uh, conservative and Republican, you as well, uh, and your incredible service to this country. The president, I think, um, recalibrated, to use that word again, recalibrated our movement uh, into much more of an America first movement, not still a line, but an America first movement, and, um, and less what it was before he came down those escalators. Just kind of your thoughts on that and, and some concluding thoughts on, on where this project is going to go and what we're going to do to save the country. Uh, we saw it in a very high profile way when President Trump came in in 2017. Uh, there were people inside the United States government who were trying to tie his hands behind his back and prevent him from withdrawing from the Iran nuclear deal. Right. And, and telling him that you can't move the embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. And there was this uh, sentence on the shelf at the State Department that was being used from one administration to the next. They would say, at this point in the Middle East peace process, comma, it is inadvisable to dot, dot, dot. And you could fill that in with whatever the president at that moment was trying to get done. And they said when President Trump was moving the embassy in Israel to Jerusalem that he was going to start World War III. Well, he didn't. Right. Actually, mm -hmm. when he got out of office and Biden and Harris administration came in, tripping over themselves to reestablish this relationship with Iran and, uh, and, and start undercutting, undermining, creating more daylight with Israel, that's when you see Hamas go into Israel. That's, that's when right. you see Russia go into Ukraine. They watched as yeah. this fatally flawed withdrawal from Afghanistan took place. I would just say this, President Trump knew how to treat friends like friends and adversaries like adversaries. He mm -hmm. wasn't trying to get rid of NATO. He was trying to strengthen it by getting other countries more invested and paying their fair share. Uh, if you're truly a friend with another country, uh, you're able to have tough conversations with them. Uh, but the reality is that as far as adversaries abroad, from Kim Jong-un uh, to the supreme leader of Iran, uh, they all understood that President Trump meant business and that if there was a threat coming out, uh, he meant it. He had the military option on the table, not because he wanted to use it, but because he didn't want to use it. It was peace through strength. He would never send our troops into harm's way unless they were sent to win. You send them to win or you don't send them at all. And when they come home, you treat our veterans with the love, dignity, and respect that they deserve on, a, on behalf of a very grateful nation. This is what we saw through his policies 
And as a result, the ISIS caliphate was eliminated. No foreign wars were created. Foreign wars were ended and our adversaries respected us. I want to go back to that. And I want President Trump to waste no time in ensuring he has the right people around him, the right policies around him. And then on day one, as soon as he's sworn in, and personally, I'm a, I'm a supporter of President Trump. I'd like to see him there. Uh, I, I know that uh, he's somebody who would be even stronger in a next four years than he was during a strong four years of foreign policy during his first term. Well, extremely well said, Lee. We could not be more excited about having you join the policy side of the House. Uh, you are truly a leader of consequence uh, and will be for many decades to come, uh, hopefully. And, and it's just a joy to have you on the team. So thank you. Thank you, Brooke. It's great to be with you.